Welcome to the podcast, Julie. I am so excited to have you here with me today. Thank you, Shakira. I'm looking forward to it as well. It's going to be a great discussion. So Julie and I actually met each other a few months ago at an event. We were both speaking um, on stage at the same event and we just uh, met and I would say it was an instant connection that we had. We both love really, at first sight. Love at first, love sight. At first sight. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we just both um, really hit it off. And um, since then we've caught up and I thought I have to have Julie on my podcast because the presentation that you gave was absolutely phenomenal all around mental health and team and how we can, you know, incorporate um, conversations around mental health into our business. And I was so blown away by your, your speaker. Um, sorry, I was going to say your speech. So blown away by your presentation that I just had to get you on the podcast. So thank you so much for being here. I would love for you to tell my audience a little bit about your history, um, a little bit about your, your career and how you sort of got to where you are today. Well, the short version of it is, is that um, I turned 50 this year and it's been this convoluted mixed bag of lollies. And I grew up in family business. So my family's business is uh, CPR hair and it used to be known as Vita5. And before that, it was Yasmin products. It's gone through a number of iterations over the years. And I get that now as a business owner, because in, in having my own business today, it's actually gone through its own iterations. I started off with a company name of Connect Mind Matters, and then I brought it back into being Julie Gillespie because I turn up and I do a lot of different things. I'm actually looking at changing it up again to better suit what it is that, you know, the market expects from me. Mm. And so I was, I've been brought up in a very adaptive, ever-changing environment in family business mm-hmm. um, where I got to do everything except accounting and finances that's always been someone else's job Mm -hmm. but when I did my studies I did uh, my bachelor of commerce um, in marketing and um, public relations so everything in that comm space and um, I loved I loved and thrived at university because I, I got to be in an environment where I could double down on what I'm good at and specifically and get direction and clarity. I love all of those things. Where in family business, you don't get that. You see it needs doing, you get and you do it, right? (laughs) So true. (laughs) Uh, So over the years, I've been a salesperson. I've been a technician. I've been a trainer educator. um, I've been a packer, a shop hand, um, a hairdressing apprentice. I, you know, didn't go through, you know, my full apprenticeship and to become a hairdresser. But I, from early days, I've been handing up perm papers and rinsing perms and, you know, finishing blow waves and, you know, mopping and sweeping floors. This opportunity of being presented with everything to do has given me the ability to know I can do the impossible. And it's such a gift to have. And and I think becoming 50, I see it as a gift now instead of (laughs) other ways I framed it over the years. Mm -hmm. But it's a gift that I'm now passing on to my children. So my kids during school holidays, they're 11 and 12 years old now, uh, they go down to the family business and they experience all areas of the business um, through school holidays. So that's as much as I spent my school holidays there, they're now doing it too, which is really cool. So they're packing parcels, they're, you know, playing with hair colours to understand, you know, how things work. They're going into marketing. Like they're doing all of these things, right? Because I want my kids to know that they can do the impossible. So when everyone else is floundering around them going, oh, my God, what do we do? They step in and just go, I don't know, but I know that we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, right, because that's, that's I guess, my superpower is that, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out along the way. Who's with me? Let's go. Mm-hmm. But also that gift of knowing that I don't have to do it on my own. Mm-hmm. And as a business owner now is uh, I, I don't do it on my own. I don't want to do it on my own. I actually wouldn't be bothered with it all if I had to do it on my own. Because being a business owner is the loneliest thing I think that anyone will ever do. Mm -hmm. 
And so, like, over the years I've found, I've, I've been looking for ways to connect into a community that makes sense to me, to find that place where I can thrash really big, bizarre, audacious stuff out there and get feedback and, and buy-in um, and collaboration. Um, I did my executive MBA a number of years ago. Um, I finished my last course down in Melbourne when I was 32 weeks pregnant. Oh, wow. You can imagine I flew from Sydney to Melbourne. They only just let me on the plane and I walked in the door and I had all of these guys because majority of them were guys saying, I'll be on her team. She, she's she's motivated. And I was like, oh, you better believe it because this this is it. Like yeah. I'm, I'm seriously, this is going to be the best thing I ever do in my entire life. Um, and it was game on and I loved it. But I did that executive MBA to know that I've, got what it takes to be the best at what I do in any room. Mm -hmm. Because every person who was doing the executive MBA were getting ready for Mm C-suite. And I wanted to know that I was going to be the person they looked to to make sense of the world around them. Mm -hmm. And I was. And it's like, okay, game on, let's go. I love that. So that's kind of like where how I got to this point, yes. you know, and do I know what I do? No, do <laughs> I, like, but I'll figure it out and yes. let's, let's move on together. Yes. And so, it's ever evolving as well. Right. Which I love, like, I love that you sort of started out in your family business and I loved all the things that you did. Cause I'm like, that sounds like all the things that I've done in my career, <laughs> addressing your friend is picking and packing orders. And <laughs> I've done accounting and bookkeeping as well. Unfortunately, small business, you just have to do all that yourself. <laughs> bookkeeper, bookkeeper, bookkeeper. No, I'm just saying like oh, 100% <laughs> the one thing I do not want to be, would not want to be doing. Oh. That's for sure. Um, but I love that. I just love hearing how you kind of just got in and like you said, rolled your sleeves up and just did whatever had to be done to get the job done. And that attitude is something that you can't really tell someone to be that way. It's something that you really have to kind of learn and grow over time. And sometimes you find people in business too who are like-minded in that sense that will just get in and do it. Um, But the fact that you've had that upbringing and you have that um, experience, I think that's just such a good mindset to come into business or a career with that mindset and you know with my kids going down now like my parents and my brother who are all in the business um, and myself have all said to the kids look don't feel you have to be a part of the business this isn't a have to do and it's like can you stop saying that I'm choosing to do this get out of my way wow and it's like done okay yeah (laughs) okay so parenting done yeah (laughs) My work here is done. Yeah, everything else I do from here on in will be the therapy. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) meeting therapy. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. No, I think that's that's amazing. What a great opportunity that they have to do that as well. Um, So I know you said that you don't really know what you do, but I would love for you to explain to um, the audience like what it is that you kind of do at the moment, like what kind of businesses you work with. Um, I'd love to know some more about that. Yeah, and it's been a fascinating, um, I'm going to frame it as six years. And the last six years, uh, I've got incredible clients that I still kind of pinch myself and just go, wow, like these these are my clients, like because they're, they're, they're very important organizations in our community. Uh, so uh, seven years ago, I was recovering from uh, my fourth massive breakdown, mental health breakdown. And I was at a point where I had to make massive changes and make a few decisions about uh, what next steps were going to be because I was in a place where I didn't think I had a next step. Uh, And I thought I was unemployable, like all of those things that we go through at certain times. The kids were still babies. Um, I think they were, what, four and five years old. Um, And we moved to Brisbane from Sydney because my husband had the opportunity of applying for a job. That was his dream job. And I literally, when I read the job description, it's like, are you taking the mickey out of me? Did you just write this and say, you know, let's go to Brisbane because this job's here, this job. (laughs) And he just went, no, this is literally the job description. And I went, well, it's yours. Let's move. Mm -hmm. 
and we did. Uh, where those type of risk takers, uh, God bless, like God bless it, that I found the guy that did that type of stuff with me. And I got to stop for the first time, I think, ever. I didn't have to do anything. and But through that process was an unravelling. And I had one of the school mums um, who I used to catch up with in an afternoon, on a Thursday afternoon, because our eldest um, was in prep doing um, art class together, you know, some. <laughs> you know, throw them in something so us mums can catch up and not have to go home yet. Um, and we'd talk about things. And I said to her one day, um, I said, I'm unemployable. And it's just really, you know, um, heartbreaking that I don't think there's anything that I can do from here on in. And she said, what a pile of shit. And I just went, oh, hang on a second. Wait, wait, wait. No one's ever spoken to me this way. What are you doing? And she said, I am so jealous of all that you've done everything that you've achieved, everything that you can do. And you're sat there saying that you're unemployable. What a crock. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> okay, I'm now listening. <laughs> you've got my attention. Yeah. And she said, what could you do? And I just went, I don't know, I love training. I love teaching people. Great. What about? Or anything. Pick one. I said, well, I don't want people to go through what I went through. What, with your mental health? Yeah. Well, okay. So mental health and teaching, go find something. That night I got onto Facebook of all places, God help us, and started scrolling through and I put in search mental health and movement because I wanted something involved in moving. Mm -hmm. And I came across a business called Mental Health and Movement. A guy called Dan Hunt, who's an ex-footy player, would go into organisations, male-dominated industry, and he had a post saying, I love and am deeply proud of being a mental health first aid instructor and being able to do this list of stuff and supporting, you know, men in challenging environments. And I was just like, oh, my God, shut the front door. What is that? And so I started my deep dive. And as I'm in the midst of that deep dive, my husband comes in from doing, um, he's a St. John um, volunteer mm -hmm. and he's a trainer for St. John. And he was at a, um, an event that evening and he came home and he said, honey, guess what? I've just heard of this thing that I think would be brilliant for you. Um, St. John is currently putting on training um, for mental health first aid. Don't just do the training itself, but I think you should be an instructor. And I just went, well, that's it. I guess that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so that's how I got into this iteration of life and 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 this version of Julie 10 point, you know, six, <laughs> um, you know, along the track. And that opened up the door for me to realize how I can frame and the narrative that I can start to tell about what it is that I do and why. But I needed that thing to be able to do that. Because for myself, I've had, you know, mental illness on and off for the past 30, well, I'd say 40 years, but 30 years diagnosed. And so for my greatest challenge being was that there weren't people around that knew what I was going through. So instead of the lean in and the shake in the tree a little and saying, what are you doing? There was a lot of pulling back. And I had to change that. I had to make that something that wasn't prevalent you know around us because one in five Australians every year have a diagnosable mental illness so it's not just me mm -hmm. you know it, it's 100% it, of people are going to be affected by this one way or another mm -hmm. and so it was right let's go because this makes sense still didn't know what it was going to look like I just figured I'll just start training and something will happen so I I, I got a place, I rented a place that had a training room and had offices and stuff like that, still not knowing what it was all going to look like, mm -hmm. but you build it and they will come, right? Um, and one day that mum who called me out, her name is Emma, Jacob's mum, still that in my phone, walked up my stairs and said, hey, I've come to work for you. And I was like, awesome, yes. No idea how I'm going to pay you and no idea what you're going to do, but we'll figure it out, right? And since then, so that was two years ago. So since then, we've just been honing and shaping and honing and shaping and trying and failing and trying and failing and and, and working it out and, and succeeding and then finding these things that I'm excellent at doing with organisations. Mm -hmm. The mental health first aid for me opens doors. 
And then it's just like, oh, you talk a bit of sense. You know what you're doing. Yeah, I can help uh, leaders with the conversations with their staff. Um, I do uh, coaching. So I do strengths profiling, disc profiling, motivators. Um, also do resilience at work. And so I do the coaching aspect, team building stuff, leadership, rejigging, and then work with companies across the entire organisation, disrupting the current narrative around mental health, redefining it, reshaping it, making sense of it. So it's something that's accessible and not this have or have not. Mm-hmm. So today in the business, it's that's what I do. And it's, it's the coaching aspect from individual and groups. It's the training aspect for the mental health first aid. And there's other programs that I do in there. Um, and then it's working with organizations to embed this into their strategy to make sure that it's not this other thing that happens down over there and let the girls down the back there can deal with the mental health stuff. It's in the boardroom. It's in the executive suite. It's in every leader's um, capability statement that they know how to have conversations around mental health and it's just part of the plan. Because mm. when it's there, it's not this big hoo-ha thing. It's just there. Mm ready to be acknowledged, validated, and action taken to ensure that the problem doesn't turn into anything more than that. Because mm-hmm. that's how we reduce illness, right? That's how we prevent illness. Mm-hmm. So I get into that front stuff, making sure it doesn't even rear its head. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. But that has taken time, as all good things do, to shape and come to the reality and understanding of. Mm. Because when I'd started this six years ago, I had no idea what it could be. I just knew it was an important conversation to start. Mm. Then, and, and five years ago, six years ago, I was thinking I was unemployable because of my mental illness. Mm-hmm. Whereas COVID happened, blessing in disguise. And then we're at this point in time where I'm actually brought in specifically because of my experience with mental illness. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marketplace. Let's go. (laughs) Right? Because this is what mental ill health can look like. Mm -hmm. Now I'm menopausal. (laughs) (laughs) Now you've got a whole other thing to deal with. (laughs) Oh, my God. That on top of it and we're a whole bit mess, right? (laughs) But it starts other conversations. It it gets us opening up other doors and having, you know, uh, new types of conversations about it. So that, that, that's kind of how it's shaped. And so the types of clients I have are prominent in our Queensland marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, I work with, and the ones, some of the organisations I work with, I don't talk about publicly. We don't do the photos for, you know, the socials and stuff like that because what they do is very private and, and for their people. But those that um, uh, have, have given me permission to speak about them is Port of Brisbane, Um, fantastic organization that are like maturing in this space so beautifully and wholeheartedly um, and every person in the organization knows they're cared for Mm -hmm. Um, and they're the gatekeepers for the Queensland economy because everything that drives our economy is going through a port one way or another Mm -hmm. Um, And the other uh, major one is ASM Global. So ASM Global, APAC are the, I guess I'm going to frame it as the property managers for stadiums and event sites, you know, throughout, um, well, globally, Mm -hmm. but the APAC region. Mm -hmm. And so, and they've recently won an award in Dubai for being a mentally healthy workplace. Wow. Of all places to talk about mental health. But this is because they're normalizing the conversation. They've got incredible people within the organisation that are driving that train and I get to partner with them in doing the mental health first aid training uh, but also engaging leaders into these discussions around normalising and, and, and disrupting that narrative that they currently hold about what mental health is and how to support someone who's struggling. Mm-hmm. And it's like incredible client base, right? Yeah. And I I sit and think some days it's like, wow, like, you know, for not always knowing what it is that I do, they've seen something that's within me that they not only need, but resonates with them. 
And I think it's that, you know, foundation of curiosity and asking the questions and happy to be adaptive to what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm Because their business, it's not about me. Mm -hmm. So how cool is that? I get to adapt into their workspace, deliver what they need in a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah. And it's, it, it's the foundation, I guess, for why my clients are happy with the work that I do is because of, of that space there. Mm-hmm. I love that. Well, that's kind of, yeah. And, and as much as, you know, it's an approach, it's not a, um, and I know you love your visions and I love, I love you know, and, and your goals and things like mm-hmm. that. It's not something specific I've put up there to say this is what I do. Yeah. And I, I heard this saying a, a while back, you know, having kids is one of the toughest gigs ever, I think, and raising children is some, some days impossible. But this idea is I'm, I'm not asking my children what they want to be when they grow up. I'm asking my children what problems do they want to solve. Mm-hmm. So it changes out of that vision goal base because someone like me with, you know, experience of mental ill health, there are some moments where I don't have a plan beyond tomorrow. Mm-hmm. it's only recently that I've even started thinking of a plan for when my husband turned 60 he said we're, we're out of here we're getting on a boat we're traveling the world <laughs> and it's like great that's about 12 years away I can do a heck of a lot of stuff in the next 12 years and I want it to look like this mm-hmm. now that's the first time that I've even thought that far ahead because I've not had the capacity to do anything else mm-hmm I know what problems I want to solve. I don't always know what that's going to look like. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. And like they always say too, that you essentially in life get paid for the problems that you solve. Like that is how you become successful in any kind of area, you know, whether that's financial or or some other way, solving problems is is it in business, you know. So yeah. I love that. And I love as well that when you started out, you weren't necessarily copying a business model that already existed. Like most business owners start out, okay, I want to open a hair salon. I can see other hair salons doing it this way. I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm, that's how I'm going to build my business. Whereas you kind of came up with this concept. You knew what you wanted to do, but you didn't quite know how you were going to get there. You didn't even know if anything like that really existed, but you were like, I'm just going to make a business that is something that lights me up and makes me happy serving other people in these different ways. And you sort of started before you even really knew what it was going to be. And I think that's such an important point too, is as much as I do talk about having a clear vision and all that, the most important thing is to start and to take action and to just go after whatever it is that you are wanting, especially if you feel called to something and it's important to you. It doesn't, you don't have to have every single piece of the puzzle completely figured out. You just got to take that first step and move in the right direction. And then everything else will start falling into place as you go. So you're such a great example of that. Well, and it's, uh, I know, don't wait to be ready to get started. Yes. And, you know, and I've learned that um, when I was working in, you know, CPR, the, I was, one of the roles that I had was in product development. So I'm also a cosmetic formulations chemist. Oh. And uh, just add that onto the list. Add that onto the list <laughs> with <Gotcha>. the MBA. <laughs> I know there's, there's a few quite, a, I'm, I'm, uh, I love um, education. I think it's my procrastination space. I'm going to go do a training course. But I, I love product. I love everything about product and the process of developing a product for people to enjoy and love. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a place of being a story listener and a story gatherer and understanding current narrative and being able to bring from that, what are the ingredients from that that are um, really important to people? What are the problem Uh, what are the problems needing to be solved? Mm -hmm. What have we currently got that can work towards solving those problems from a technical aspect, but as well as a storytelling aspect? And then working the way through, selecting ingredients, selecting product profiles, putting together a story for a team of people. They would get storyboard for product development and marketing with all of the ideas, the colours and the explanations of the output from all of that listening. 
Mm-hmm. And then it would, you know, would start putting products together. I'd take the storyboard to suppliers and say, you know, this is what I'm dreaming of. This is what I'm thinking of. And it, they would go, oh, Julie, I, can I send this through to our product development chemists in Singapore and Italy and all around the world? And it's like, yep, yeah, sure. I'm wanting something that speaks to this need. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be this technical cosmetic chemical yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. It would be a story. And then I'd go to a fragrancer. Now, there's only one fragrance developer in this country. And I'd go to him and say, John, I need something that tells this story, that evokes this feeling, but I've got this type of chemistry that I've got to work with. And he would just sit and just go, Julie, like, I love, I love this, like, you know, whatever you need. Um, So, like, that process is the exact process of what I've been doing these past six years. Mm -hmm. And as a chemist, 99% of the time I'm failing because I try a product, it doesn't work. I try a tweak, it doesn't work. I try this, it doesn't quite work. And I'm used to going to market with minimal viable product. Mm -hmm. But my minimal viable is a lot higher than a lot of other people's standard minimals. But it's still minimal viable. And people would say, Julie, is it perfect? It's like, of course not. Mm -hmm. Who's telling me it's perfect? The market. It's got to get in their hands before we can go. Mm -hmm. And we did that with the CPR phase one. You know, that was the the first product that I got to develop. I did packaging design and naming and all of that beforehand from being a kid. But from phase one, then it was the the um, re-formulating of all of the shampoos and conditioners coming into the brand CPR. Um, It was then amplifying everything along the way and making sure we had natural technology that worked for people. Mm-hmm. But it had to work. It had to get in people's hands and work in a functional way that made sense to them, mm-hmm. but also from a storytelling way. Mm-hmm. So, and that's just all I do now. That's amazing. I love that. You really took that like experience and the, I guess the, the telling of the stories and, and, and even like you said, like you didn't know all the chemical names and you weren't like, that wasn't what you were kind of going in with. Like, I need this chemical to do this or whatever. It was like, yeah. this is this is the story. And you told, you still got your message across, but in a way that worked for you. Yeah, but also a way that worked for them because to, you know, the, the translation, you know, of uh, things needed to happen, right? But it took me a while in this phase of life to realise that all of those skill sets, all of those things that I was I was doing back then are the skill sets that I'm using now. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't have to learn something new. Mm-hmm. I actually just need to repurpose it and do exactly what I've been really good at doing for so many years, like 30 years of my life has gone into that mm-hmm. and just repurpose it. Yay, let's do that. I, I, I don't have I don't have to learn something new. I don't have to be any more than I already am. I, I don't have to, you know, think I'm an imposter. No, I'm not. Yeah. Because I'm good at what I do. Yeah. It just looks very different than what it used to. Yeah. But these wow. are the skills I've been working on for a very long period of time. And they're mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that too, that um, sometimes I will even tell my coaching clients, like you need to, sometimes you need to take a break from learning and personal development and just go and do the things that you know you should be doing. Like it's, it can be so addictive sometimes to buy a new course or learn a new thing. And it's like, we think we procrastinate. Yeah. We think we need that next thing to learn something. And, and sometimes we just need to actually do the things we know we're supposed to do and, and just trust within ourselves that we already have the answers and that we already know we most likely already know what we need to do we don't need confirmation from someone else we we know what the right thing to do is for ourselves and that that's the hardest space to be in because we'll always tip into that you know when things aren't going so well our you know reserves are down whatever it is we still go into that when my mental health is ebbing and flowing when my hormones are doing funny things because of menopause you know I too go still into that space but I know that it's for a moment. Mm-hmm. I know that this is just happening. This is just something that's going to cycle through and I'll come back and reconnect in with where I'm at and get rolling again. Mm-hmm. And it's just a little bump. It's not even really about my capability, my you know, my skills, my strengths. Sometimes it's just a capacity thing. 
Mm-hmm. Then it's like, great, I can be gentle with that. Yeah. There was this idea I was talking with Emma about um, recently of imposter syndrome um, because Emma's currently doing her coaching course mm-hmm. um, to be a results coach. Oh, and nice. which she, yeah, I know, which it, she was petrified about because it's like, who am I to do this? And it's like, well, pff, we're going to have that conversation we had six years ago, but it's coming at you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was this idea around imposter syndrome. And if we see it in a different, little bit different way, disrupt the narrative on it, right, and say what we're feeling in imposter syndrome is like the little girl who's trying to get hurt. Mm-hmm. What that space is, is that that little girl wanting to be heard learned all of these things she needed to do to protect herself from the hurt, the rejection, the missteps, the failures, from all of those things. And it's built up all of this stuff in and around it. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're feeling that imposter syndrome, it's for me that little girl out front who's trying to be heard and doing all of these things just to be seen. And they can have us behaving in really, you know, weird ways. Mm And there's this idea then of being able to go, oh, my God, you've learnt so much through this process, but I'm a grown-ass adult and I've got this and I've got you coming. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. And that process for me is a way of being able to just (sighs) exhale, absorb all of that in of who I am, Yeah, there are doubts. What are the doubts trying to tell me? What are the signals that I've been missing that's brought the little girl out to be heard? Okay, I can do something about those. And those signals might be a client's not not getting back to me. Um, I may have said something that I didn't feel quite landed. Like there'll be little bits and pieces, whereas instead of the little girl out there who's trying to be heard, I bring her in. And I call the client and say, hey, I just wanted to check on something. How did this come across for you? And then I I ask, what's real? Hmm. And and then it's like, okay, cool. Well, I'm not going to assume anything. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. That's a very, very, very powerful tool. Um, I'd also love to talk to you a little bit more about sort of mental health, um, especially in the workplace as well. And when, when managing a team, um, because I know personally, I don't know if it's just sort of my generation maybe, or sort of how I grew up. It's sort of like when you come to work, you just, you know, pull up, pull up your boots and get on with it. And you don't really talk about how you're feeling or if you're having a bad day, it doesn't matter. You just kind of push it to the side and you, you just get on with things. You know, that's sort of always been my mentality. And I almost feel like now, and I'm sure other business owners feel this way too, because there is so much talk of mental health. Sometimes it's hard to know how to navigate those conversations, how to open up the conversation, but also how to kind of differentiate, I guess, between, um, you know, when someone's sort of saying, sort of blaming everything on mental health to the point where they can't work or they can't do things and work because of mental health, you know, how do you sort of navigate, you know, that conversation where it's like, you don't want to dismiss what someone's saying, but you also like what to take seriously, what not to take seriously, just how to navigate those conversations. I find it challenging myself. So I would love to know what, what you have to say on that. Yeah, and, and, and this is a position as business owners we can be in, and it's frustrating. Mm. And what it does, it has us trying to be nice and just keep being nice. I'll oh, see, look, I'm caring for you, I'm taking care of you, and we go into these nice platitudes of I just need this resolving. That also comes from a place of fear that I don't want to get this wrong because I don't want this to be a lawsuit, mm-hmm. right? Totally. But this is the reality of it. These are the conversations I'm in all the time where it's small, medium or large business. Mm-hmm. What we're doing in those moments of being nice is we're actually giving that person the, the permission to not do their job. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is that they're then not doing their job and we're frustrated and we're angry and their whole team is frustrated and angry because you're treating them in a way that's with kit gloves and they're having to pick up the work and so they're annoyed. And what can happen is that it can turn us into being an asshole. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm using that word very specifically here. Mm -hmm. It has us doing things and saying things that can be aggressive or passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. Because then we start looking at ways of dismissing the person. We then start looking at ways of ostracizing or excluding the person because we just don't want to deal with it anymore. Hopefully they'll go away. Mm -hmm. Whereas we need to start looking at how do we balance the care that we have for our people with accountability to get the job done. Mm -hmm. Because that's the balance we're looking for. That's the balance that we need to strike on a regular basis in every single thing that we do. And you'll love this because a lot of it's process driven. Mm -hmm. Love that. Music to my ears. (laughs) Music to your ears. I know that. So in our processes, there needs to be this idea of how does this care for my people and how does this communicate with clarity what it is that I expect from them? So everything is in that foundation because those that thrive are thriving because there's clarity on what's expected. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Children are the same. If you are clear with children what your expectations are and there's the the positive reward as well as consequences for not, you've got kids that are happy. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had kids coming into my household where they've not had rules. They come into my household, they know I have rules Mm -hmm. and they thrive and they love it. And I've even, I was a step parent for a number of years and I used to have the the friends' kids come in and their parents come in and the kids say to the parents, no, we don't do that here. And they the parents look at me like, what? What's going on here? It's like, no, well, we do it this way here because of these things. And through that, what we've come to understand is this. So I explain it with clarity and with detail mm-hmm. and they go, oh, I need to do that at home. It's, and the kid turns around and goes, yeah, it'd be great. Thanks, mum. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm really sorry. (laughs) But I'm clear about it. And not only, you know, am I clear about it up front, I'm consistent and it's repeatable. Mm -hmm. What that means is that I've got these clear boundary settings and I'm, I'm, I'm letting people know when they're getting close to them or if they step over them. But what it also sets up for me is their boundaries. Because oftentimes when we go into the clear, uh, the the niceness and, you know, trying to be, you know, um, help someone, what we're doing is we're trying to fix them. And then we're telling them what to do, how to do it. We're taking responsibility for their outcomes, feeling what they're feeling, you know, the empathy and all of this stuff. And, you know, and, and we're putting their needs before our own. It's actually disempowering. Mm-hmm. And it's us stepping over their boundaries. And when we think of it that way, we're being quite rude. Mm -hmm. So when we're in that situation where we do have someone who's got mental health challenges, what I invite all business owners to do, managers, leaders, whatever position that you hold where you're caring for other people, is to be able to say to someone, hey, this is the second or third time that you've said that there's a mental health challenge you're experiencing at the moment. How long has this been going on for? Is this something that you've spoken to someone about? Because that's a hard challenge to overcome. Mm -hmm. And they might go, I don't know, who would I talk to? Great question. Shall we have a look at the someone that you could speak to? Because I don't think this is just something that a friend can magically wave a wand on and and everything's going to be better. It seems to be really affecting you. Mm. Does that sound all right for you that we reach out to someone? Now, what that does every single step of the way is keeping the responsibility of their emotions, their feelings and their outcomes with them Mm -hmm. and letting them know that you care enough to ask these types of questions. Mm -hmm. And this is what compassionate empathy is, right? It's being able to acknowledge and validate the experience of what someone's you know, going through and how they're feeling about it, how they're being affected by a situation Mm -hmm. and then helping to support them to take action. Mm. Balance between emotion and logic. Mm -hmm. It's a practice because this is not my natural communication style. Yeah, yeah. This isn't like, you know, I come from, you know, with having mental ill health over the years, uh, it shuts down language pathways. It's just part of it. Yeah. Um, my mum always knew more about my friends than I did. Mm. 
because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to lean in. I didn't know what to do. I sat in fear the entire time of getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, mum would turn around and say, Julie, have you spoken with Jo recently? Like, you know, she's had a really tough time. It's like, oh, what did she go through? Well, you ask her and find out. I was like, no, 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 she seems fine. If she wanted my help, she'll come to me. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I'm coming from, way down that track, down there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But it's only through listening to over a thousand stories from, you know, the training room now of people going through challenges and who've got people in their lives that are going through challenges that I've come to understand that by saying something and by asking questions and sitting in a space of curiosity, we're able to help support people more effectively and through kindness Mm -hmm. uh, without having to fall into the nice trap. Yeah. I love that. I love that too, that you, the way that you approach this, because I guess for myself being a business owner, when someone has approached me with things like this before, I feel like it's my responsibility to have these big, long conversations and try to help them fix things. And then that's very overwhelming and like exhausting for you. Then as the business owner, you sometimes feel like you're taking on everyone's problems, you know, and because you think you're and doing the right thing. Your mental health. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. help, you know, and it, and it's hard. So I love that in this, you're really putting the onus back on them, like saying, I'm here for you. I care about you. I want to help you, but I also can't be your, um, I can't be the one to, you've got to help yourself essentially, you know, and I love and the that. Language, and the language around that starts to evolve and develop as we practice it more. Mm. And I get to the point where I don't even say, I want to help you now. Mm -hmm. because I might not be on their helper list. Yes. And so there's this idea of, hey, I see that there's a lot going on for you at the moment. Do you have what you need to be able to move through this challenge? Mm -hmm. And they might go, yeah, I've got a few things going on that uh, I think I've got what I need. Okay. If there's something else that you need, and especially while you're here at work, something that's going to make things a little bit easier, let me know, okay? Mm -hmm. I've still not said I or me in the sense of I'm going to be the one to fix and solve it, Mm -hmm. but let me know what that would look like and let's talk about it. Let's work through it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Right. So helpful. I know another thing that you mentioned when I spoke to you this about this initially was the conversation of the yes and, (laughs) and I loved that concept. I don't know if you'd like to share a bit about that. Oh, let's do it. Because so often um, I hear a lot of speakers say, um, just start saying no. And I find no quite rude if someone's asking you for help and for you to say no. Um, I find it really abrupt and disconnecting. Mm -hmm. And what's, because what's happening, that person's asking for help, like we tell people to. And, you know, for us, it should be a signal that something's needed we mightn't be the right person for it or have capacity, but there's a far more positive way of being able to um, help that person. So say someone comes to you and says, uh, Shakira, you know, this big thing's just happened and I don't know what to do about it. Can you help me by, you know, talking to this person and smoothing things over? The answer to that can be in your brain, you're screaming, no, (laughs) in, in, you know, what you can be saying to that person is, yes, I can see what it is that you're going through. That must be really tough. I'm sorry that's happened. And I want to let you know that you've actually got this. If you were to have that conversation, what would it be? Because what that person's saying in that time is, I don't know what to do, so can you do it? Well, what if we're in a position of helping that person know what to do so they can do it? How are they going to feel about themselves when they've got that information? More empowered? Yeah. Mm. Guess what? Problems Mm de-escalated in a few short words. Yes, I see what you're asking for. I'm sorry that's happened. That must be really tough. If you were to have this or and I'm not sure me doing it is going to help you. And I bet you can. I know that you've got this. What would it look like? What would it sound like? Yes, and. I love that. It's, it's not only empowering, but it's also validating them and saying, yes, 
I hear you, your feelings are valid, you know, yes. and like you have, you are capable and you have the power within you to handle this situation yourself. Let me help you work out how you're going to handle it, you know. Yeah. So again, not taking on the problem, not taking on the responsibility yourself as a business owner. I, I think of it, of keeping it outside here is that I'm, I'm seeing it, I, I, it makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. not mine. Mm-hmm. And let's get it out here for you as well because holding this inside and ruminating and spinning with it, it's hurting you. Yeah. Let's have a look at it. What's going on? Can you give me the facts? Take the emotion out. Don't get hooked. And I'll interrupt people. Don't let it hook you. Just give me the data points. In, in chronological order if you have to because that just sets the brain up a bit differently. Mm-hmm. We start to de-escalate and come into prefrontal cortex because we have to remember these types of details and the logic. Mm-hmm. And through that process, it's like what one of these things is the most sticking point? What would you like to do about it? What are the obstacles? Mm-hmm. Can I help resolve that obstacle? Because that right there, that's something I can do. Have you got this? I believe in you. Mm -hmm. It changes everything about how we approach connecting with people Mm -hmm. but also leading teams Mm -hmm. because I'm not, I don't want to do people's jobs for them. Like I don't want to manage people. I'm a really bad manager. Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) it's, it's like I get really frustrated if, you know, if, someone's got their job to do and I'm needing to do it with them or I'm, I'm, and, and this is, I'm not a perfectionist and I love this aspect of myself is that I trust them to do their job. That's why I've employed them, but I'm going to be really clear on what my expectations are and so they can meet it and then job done. That's it. Mm -hmm. Because if I feel I have to go in there and tidy up for someone and, and fix it for them, how demoralizing is that? And how rude is that? Mm -hmm. so my narrative is very different how I approach these things um, today especially is really different Mm -hmm. Uh, the way Emma and I operate in a lot of ways is she'll say Julie I've got something for you that's at uh, about 60% because it's new something I haven't played with before Mm -hmm. Uh, can you get it to the next phase and I'll say right great, I'll get it to about the 70, 75% because I just need to go in and fix a few things up. Mm -hmm. And then she'll take it that bit further and go, right, it's ready for your polish. Yeah. But we're clear on that process. I'm not expecting her in new things that she's never done before that I've had 30 years of experience in doing to come to me with something that like I would. Mm -hmm. But she needs to learn. There's clear definition. There's training. Um, and there's this idea that she can own the process Mm. Mm -hmm. and not have to be right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I love that. That's such a good approach to it as well. Like it's a, it's a collaborative approach, but it's not like a micromanaging or a, you know, a demoralizing type of thing. You're just, you're working on it together, but it's, you're also letting her do it in a way that feels good to her as well. So it takes the ego out of it. Yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm very much the same as a leader. I like to give my expectations or I'll say, this is the end result of what I want. I don't mind how you want to get to that point. It's up to you, whatever works best for you. And, and, and oftentimes my team are doing things day to day. They actually have a better understanding of the process or they have a better, you know, way of doing things because they're doing it day in, day out. So I'm like, you do it how you want, but I just need this end result. And then That's perfect. And that's their training and that's their expertise. Yes, exactly. I don't have to have all the answers. Thank God for that. Yeah, (laughs) it's great. Like, let's celebrate that. Yeah. I don't have to. And and I have to, I don't have to have many answers at all, Mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Yeah. Because it's not about me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love that very, very much. I think this has been so helpful, all of this valuable knowledge that you have shared. Um, and I just want to leave you with one question. So the question that I like to ask people is what is something that you often think about, but don't speak about? For me, I've learned to say those things out loud. 
that moment that I sit in the idea of, oh, should I say that, is the moment I'm going to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for instance, um, someone will say something that I find really judgmental or rude towards someone else. That's normally when we shut up, right? Mm-hmm. I'll just step in and go, oh, where did that come from? I didn't expect that. And it's out and it's done. Because I find that way, then it's not something that we're going to ruminate about later where, or that the it actually de-escalates the situation um, and it's not something I'm going to have to carry with me. I should have said this, I should have, could have, would have, if, but maybe. Like I can't, I can't have that inside of me. There's no room for it. Mm-hmm. And surprisingly, by doing that, I've not offended anyone yet. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's a it's a great like comeback. You know, it's a great thing to say because it's not it like you said it de-escalates a situation. You know, because silence is agreement. Mm. Mm, true. How many god awful things are we sitting back in silence, afraid of saying something, but is being misconstrued and misunderstood to be agreement? Mm-hmm. <sighs> yep. Absolutely. And it's a practice. But mm. I'm still yet to offend someone. <laughs> I keep trying. <laughs> oh, no, it's it's amazing. I Well, I love it. I love all of the knowledge and just valuable wisdom that you've shared. And I absolutely love what you're doing with your business. I think you're going to help so many people in this world that truly need the help and you know, it's absolutely incredible. So if any of my listeners would like to find out more about you, where can they find you? Uh, Well, I'm in the business corporate world of things. So I sit in the space, uh, LinkedIn's my go-to. So um, it's a lot easier. I don't have to be on there every day, thank goodness, Um, or my website. And I'll make sure you've got all of those details. But look for Julie Gillespie. And generally, I'm in a hot pink jacket. So you can see me a mile off. (laughs) and, and I do everything from individual to group coaching um, and then training. I do the mental health first aid training for organisations. Um, so the, there are the types of things that I'm in working with. But I also do the speaking like we did for CPR here mm-hmm. um, at the Salon Forum uh, about these topics and kind of disrupting that narrative mm-hmm. is is where I sit. Mm-hmm. So look me up and generally you'll find me. There's not too many Julie Gillespie's out there. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much and thank you for your time today. And thank you, Shakira. I will talk to you soon. Will do. Thank you.